The Confederation of African Football CAF postpones the Africa Cup of Nations Championship and the African Cup of Nations AFCON both competitions to be hosted by Cameroon to, uh, to 2021 and 2022 respectively due to COVID-19. Defence Chiefs of Cameroon and Equatorial Guinea resolve to ensure that the populations living along both sides of the border maintain peaceful coexistence during a meeting here in Yaoundé. Final year pupils in the English subsystem of education have written the government common entrance examination, while those of the French subsystem sat for the concours d'entrée en sixième nationwide. And those are top stories. Thanks for joining us on this edition of the 7:30 News. I am Gladys Tata. Each of us must comply with the measures that have been taken. It's official. The 2020 African Nations Championship Chan that Cameroon was to host in April this year has been postponed to January 2021. Similarly, the 2021 African Cup of Nations initially scheduled for Cameroon has also been postponed to 2022. These decisions were arrived at today by members of the Executive Committee of the Confederation of African Football CAF via a video conference as they discussed the way forward for African football affected by COVID-19. Baldwin Sama comes back to some of the major resolutions taken at that meeting in the following report. The wait to see Cameroon host two great football competitions will have to persist as the devastating effects of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic will see an entire nation's quest to thrill the world with two successful organizations pushed to 2021 and 2022 respectively. Meeting this Tuesday through video conference, executive committee members of the Confederation of African Football decided to postpone the 2020 African Nations Championship that Cameroon was due to host in April this year to January 2021 due to the COVID-19 spread. The biggest football competition on the African continent, the Africa Cup of Nations, initially to take place in January and February 2021 in Cameroon, has been pushed forward to January 2022. CAF's executive committee members equally decided that the semi-final of the CAF Cup this year will be played in a single match in Morocco, with the final still in Morocco. Worthy of note is the fact that the 2020 Africa Women's Cup of Nations previously programmed for November this year has been cancelled, paving the way for the launch of a new competition, the Women's African Champions League in 2021. The 2020 CAF Awards have equally been cancelled and CAF has decided to increase their support to member associations to help them mitigate the ongoing COVID-19 challenges. Cameroon can today boast of an impressive home, uh, number of sports and football infrastructures to host the two international competitions. Apart from the Limba Omni Sports Stadium used during the 2016 Women's AFCON, the Olympic Stadium to be completed will be added to the constructed Japoma Sports Complex in Douala, the renovated Garua Rumdeaja Stadium and the Bafuzam Omni Sports Stadium as new infrastructures for the upcoming Shan and AFCON. Daniel Ekonde now outlines the stadia that exists in the country in the following report. The four additional stadia for the upcoming events are already in place. The exception, the Olympic Stadium with 60,000 seats, is attaining perfection for the grand event, with the chairs and playing surface already planted. Beautifying the structure is the focus now. The Olympic track and commercial area of the stadium are taking shape and the construction company McGill is positive to deliver the facility before the deadline. Lying in wait is the room that just stadium in Garua. Ever since its renovation, the facility remains a reference center in the north region. This four-star hotel in the plateau neighborhood in Garua is also built to lodge players during the AFCON. In Douala, 
the Japoma Sports Complex and the Reunification Stadium stand tall in view of the football events. With a capacity of 50,000 people, Japoma is already set to welcome Africa. Just on the other side of the town, the Reunification Stadium in Bepanda is another proof of Cameroon's preparedness to host the AFCON 48 years after the 1972 edition which it hosted. Added to these are the sites in Limbe, Boya and Bafusam, long fit to host the African Nations Championship and the Africa Cup of Nations. Let's now go over to the Ministry of Sports and Physical Education, where Ben and Buma Ghana is standing by to get Minister Nassis Mwele Kombi's reactions to the resolutions by the CAF Executive Committee. Hello, Benen. Good evening. Good evening, Gladys, and welcome to the audience room of the Ministry of Sports and Physical Education. Just like you said it, um, we follow the resolutions of the uh, CAF executive meeting, which uh, we followed that the minister also followed by a video conference. And we rush right to the uh, Ministry of Sports and Physical Education uh, to meet the minister. Mr. Minister, good evening. Good evening. Uh, what, what, what is your first reaction, the first reaction of the Minister of Sports and Physical Education and that of the government after the resolution from the CAF executive? meeting before I proceed I would like uh, to present my cordial greetings and sincere gratitude to CAF and its uh, illustrious uh, president uh, Mr. Ramad Ahmad for their frank collaboration with uh, Cameroon the decisions uh, taken today are among others related to the new dates and periods announced and the integrate all the various constraints and consequences resulting from the international health crisis caused by the COVID-19, which has been threatening the entire planet for several months now. These decisions which uh, Cameroon, host country, of the two major competitions of the Confederation of African Football has taken note of definitively and clearly states that the sixth edition of the African National Championship, that is to say Shan, is not cancelled. The edition of the Africa Cup of Nations, AFCON, on Cameroonian soil is maintained. The finals of the prestigious Champions League is also maybe maintained in Cameroon. However, for a better organization of this event, consultations between CAF and Cameroon will be made. I would also like uh, to reiterate that with regard to Shan, Cameroon, that was quite ready to host the competition on the Yaoundé Fandena, Douala Japoma, Douala Bepanda, Limbebuea sites from April 4th to 25th of this year, date previously adopted by the Confederation of African Football, will be more so within the context of the new programming. With uh, regard to AFCON, the Yaoundé Olembe, Yaoundé Fadena, Douala Limbe, Bouya, Bafusa Mangarwa sites, which already are looking good with magnificent infrastructures, constant and sustained efforts are permanently being made. All means are put in place under the very high impetus of the head of states, His Excellency Paul Bia, President of the Republic, and the coordination of the Prime Minister, Head of Government, Chief Dr. Joseph Dion Goutet, President of Comiccan. So the most fantastic of competitions takes place when the time comes in better conditions. As concerns the finals of the CAP Champions League, 
the Japoma Stadium, which is to host the competition, is also ready. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minister, for that reaction. What is very clear now is that there is still some uh, time for uh, a perfect organization. Uh, the minister said six months is not very, very long. So in January, Cameroon will be hosting Africa for the Africa Nations Championship. And 2022 is going to be the AFCON all in Cameroon. Over to you, Gladys, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, same to you, uh, Ben and Bomagana, and hope to be in your company same time tomorrow. And uh, on to other news, Cameroon's minister delegate of the presidency in charge of the National Defense of Equatorial Guinea have stated the commitment of their heads of state to ensuring that the people on both sides of their common border live in harmony. The two ministers were speaking today in Yaoundé while co-chairing a high-level meeting of ministers of defense of the nations. Ebniza Akanga is just back with this report. Speaking at the opening of the high-level meeting, Cameroon's minister delegate at the presidency in charge of defense, Joseph Betiasomo, said that there has been misunderstandings between Cameroon and Equatorial Guinea of recent over a project by Equatorial Guinea to build what is said to be a wall at the border between the two countries. A project which the government of Cameroon sees encroaches into our territory. According to the minister delegate, President Paul Bia of Cameroon and Teodoro Obiangema Mbazago of Equatorial Guinea have authorized the holding of the high-level meeting in Yaoundé to address the misunderstandings. Joseph Betia Somos stated that President Bia and the people of Cameroon are strongly committed to sub-regional integration and peace with Equatorial Guinea. He expressed the hope that the dialogue that has begun with the holding of the high-level meeting will lead to a peaceful resolution of the misunderstandings and build confidence in relations between the two countries. On his part, the Minister of National Defense of Equatorial Guinea, Leandro Bakale Kogo, said that a new page has opened in relations between the two countries. The high-level meeting will examine and adopt proposals made by Defense Chief of Staff of Cameroon and Equatorial Guinea on mechanisms of bilateral military cooperation. The document that will be adopted will be submitted to heads of state of the two countries for validation. Cameroon and Equatorial Guinea are working on a mixed commission to solve their terrestrial border differences. The statement was made today by the country's Minister for Regional Integration, Baltazar Ngonga Ejo. This was during an audience at the Minister of External Relations, as Charles Ibune tells us in the following details. A rain-washed audience, an audience at the Ministry of External Relations, with one topic under discussion, the seemingly border difference, terrestrial, between Cameroon and Hanebo, Equatorial Guinea. Two delegations attend the audience to iron out issues and fix modalities for normalcy. The Cameroonian delegation is led by External Relations Minister Mbela Mbela and is equally composed of the minister delegate to the Ministry of External Relations in charge of relations with the Commonwealth, Felix Mbayou, and Cameroon's ambassador to Equatorial Guinea, Lazar Poe Bala. On the other side, from Equatorial Guinea, the delegation is led by the country's Minister of State for Regional Integration, Batarza Ngonga Ejo. We and the Minister of External Relations are working out a calendar to set up a mixed commission to review all the accords which were previously signed in order to clarify the situation. Cameroon and Equatorial Guinea are members of the Economic and Monetary Community of Central African States, CEMAC, and are equally members of the Economic Community of Central African State, ACAS, and all parties are working towards regional integration to make the African continental free trade area a reality. Ties between Cameroon and Equatorial Guinea uh, span uh, they span decades and so too their independence, be it at the socio-cultural, political or economic levels. Both countries have forged a relationship beneficial for both which experts say it will be in their interest to preserve. Clarice Aretakang tells us more. 
A common social cultural background and mutual economic and political links for the interest of both, which they should endeavor to preserve. This is the view of international development experts on the ties that bind Cameroon to Equatorial Guinea, separated by a border but united in more ways than one. They are populations that have the same language, the same history, and uh, uh, the same culture. Economically, there are strong links between uh, um, Equatorial Guinea and Cameroon. Uh, politically, they are member states of the same regional economic communities. In the south region of Cameroon, there's a, 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 a tri-border area where uh, Cameroonian uh, producers export their goods to Equatorial Guinea. Trade has been a non-negligible contributing factor in preserving cooperation between Yaoundé and Malabo. Border security and the need to enforce effective sub-regional integration have oftentimes been at the center of debates in both countries. While social political views may vary, interdependence calls for actions and interactions based on strategic reactions. Cameroon's uh, document for, uh, for emergence, the DSCE, has an important section of it which is devoted to uh, sub-regional cooperation and including cooperation with Equatorial Guinea. And it's the same thing for Equatorial Guinea. It has a whole section devoted to uh, cross-border cooperation, and especially with Cameroon. Second stake is the preservation of forests. You know, uh, Cameroon and Equatorial Guinea have a large uh, uh, forest area which crosses the zone, and what goes on on the one side has repercussions on the other side. The first thing is political and military. The relationship between Cameroon and Equatorial Guinea is decades old. Domestic agendas may differ, but opinions hold that it is in the interest of both to keep their partnership going as global ambitions evolve. And in the face of multiple and multifaceted acts of provocation, Cameroon, in her usual style and option, has bargained for a peaceful resolution of her differences with a natural and friendly neighbor, Equatorial Guinea. Dialogue is the tool President Bia has convened Equatorial Guinea with, and the Yaoundé high-level administrative diplomatic defense and security meeting is materializing as a mark of peace through the force of argument. Kilian Dan Difon, in our newsroom commentary, situates the place of dialogue in a happy denouement of repeated tensions between Cameroon and Equatorial Guinea. Cameroon shares a borderline of over 300 kilometers with Equatorial Guinea geographically and to a large extent with cultural similarities. The two countries are bonded by nature. But human activity has over the years planted seeds of discord. Many times Cameroonians have been chased away from Equatorial Guinea sometimes reportedly maltreated. There has been established incidents of some defense and security forces encroaching into Cameroonian land. Several, especially the commercial borders, have been physically blocked by one of Cameroon's five cherished neighbors. And currently, one too many an incident is the provocative building of a physical wall which doesn't stand on the official UN-recognized boundary but deep into the Cameroonian soil. Cameroon has displayed her resolve and tact in handling border disputes with the example of the acclaimed peaceful resolution of the litigation with Nigeria over the Bakasi Peninsula. It is the same approach used in the current land and maritime tensions with Equatorial Guinea. Legality, dialogue and a show of good faith are the options Cameroon has put on the table. It is a noble bargain that has worked before and it is working today, initiated at strategic and policy level by President Paul Mia, bought by his Equator Guinean counterpart, Theodoro Obiange Mambasauga, an interstate border demarcation commission is at work. Diplomatic avenues are being explored. Administrative and defense experts are using the force of argument and the citizens at the borders who belong to the same ethnic groups continue to share their common cultural identity, though in different countries. If there is an ultimate weapon, then it is the current dialogue between the two countries. And uh, this press, uh, this decree, uh, Cameroon's new ambassador to France has been appointed by President Paul Bia. André Manus Ekomo was appointed by a presidential decree today. 
Uh, the International Association of Parliamentarians for Peace has enjoined legislators to be peace crusaders and work for the development of their communities. This was during the Parliamentarian Action Day for Peace, chaired by Deputy Speaker, Speaker Honorable Theodore Datuo. Meantime, the Finance and Budget Committee held its 22nd exchange with the audit bench of the Supreme Court. Esther Kima tells us more. These members of parliament sharing their experiences and wisdom to bear in the search of solutions to conflicts rocking the world agree that peace is invaluable. The Deputy Speaker, Honorable Theodore Dato, outlining the virtues of peace, exhorted the law to show compassion to victims of the unrest in the northwest and southwest regions and also to communities affected by the coronavirus pandemic. For the executive president of the association, Honorable Brigitte Emabot, their contributions in the past have paid off in the Universal Peace Federation. Many people believe that it is only when you talk violence, it's only when you are violent, then can you bring peace. On the contrary, you have to make people to understand one thing, that peace has no price. The second thing is that you have to give people God. And when you give them God, their hearts begin to change. And when their hearts begin to change, they start talking peace. Meantime, the Finance and Budget Committee of the National Assembly, in its 22nd exchange with the audit bench of the Supreme Court, examined the role of the two control structures in the management of public mm -hmm. funds. Focus was on the decentralization process and the functioning of regional courts. We have the problem of the installation of the regional audit courts and uh, the revision of the laws. They should be instituted and it, they should go functional so that it can also congest the audit bench. They expect a review of the laws governing the audit bench, which makes the body binding in terms of sanctions against defaulting accountants. The wearing of face masks in public places will be mandatory until further notice. We now go over to the Public Health Emergency Operations Center where Gilbert Ongene is uh, on standby with the latest on the coronavirus situation in the country. Good evening, uh, Gilbert Ongene. What's new over there? Hello, Gladys Tata. Welcome to the Public Health Emergency Operations uh, Center. Well, I must say that uh, today at the press briefing uh, given by Dr. Alain George Etundi Mbala on behalf of the Minister of Public Health, he paid glowing tribute to the uh, media and pressmen who have been uh, working relentlessly to provide uh, useful and credible information on the pandemic uh, to the public this far. And he also stressed on the fact that the social media should not be relied on because uh, it's like a trash can where everybody can uh, put in what he or she wants. He also touched on the peak period issue, which is preoccupying many people. Uh, you know, uh, at one time, we expected the peak period of this epidemic to be in mid-June, uh, the month that's just wrapping up now. Uh, the question of the peak period, uh, Dr. Alain George Tundimbala did uh, say that uh, the strategy of government or the target of government is not about meeting a peak period as such, it's about the uh, 3T, that is uh, tracking, testing and treating. And that's what I've been doing, trying to make sure that the number of recoveries uh, can meet up and surpass the number of new cases so that the situation can be stabilized, the graph can be stabilized, so that we get to a stage where they call the plateau, and now the uh, graph start descending. Uh, tonight we have our uh, guest, he is a public health expert, Dr. Eric uh, Tandy, our uh, usual guest. Good evening, welcome to Seattle once more, Doc. Good evening, Gilbert. Now, tell us, we're talking about this famous uh, peak uh, period that was expected between the 10 and the 15th of June. Did it actually happen, what happened along the time, along the line, looks as like if we lost track of the, that period. Yeah, Gilbert, uh, just like you mentioned or you heard from 
uh, the incident uh, manager in the press briefing representing the minister a few minutes ago, it's not all about uh, the peak or arriving the peak period. It's all about getting people tested and getting the, the situation stable. I think what is important here is to note that uh, with the decentralization process, we wanted all the districts in the national territory to have the means to test each and every one. And if there was a projection between the mid of June, it was due to this government strategy to bring the testing to the population right at the grassroots. And I think this is what was done. And again, I want to remind you here that arriving the peak might be possible if the population decide at all time to go in for proper testing so that uh, we can now say we have put the situation on control if all regions or if everyone decided to move and go to know their status as far as COVID-19 is concerned with the rapid testing that has been provided. Now, what uh, stage of the pandemic do we expect in the nearest future, in the days or uh, weeks ahead? Yeah, I think with the decentralization process, uh, sensitization has been intensified. How? By taking communication right to the population themselves. I think the population, the leaders, the community leaders have taken the lead to sensitize the population so that each and every one in the community should be aware that it is important to go in for COVID-19 screening. And going in for COVID-19 screening meaning that we want to curb, we want to put an end to the disease within our community by identifying those who are potential candidates. You know, when I use the word candidate, I'm simply referring to those who are suspected cases and who, after diagnosis, have been cleared off or declared positive. So if we have this individual out from our community, then we can now be proud to say we can put an end to the epidemic within our communities. Last short question. The behavior of people in the society determines uh, the stage and level of the pandemic. Is that true? Yeah, uh, I must say here that discipline between you and I, we are putting on a face mask, but we still have this laxity within our communities. But I want to believe that because we've taken this challenge to the community themselves for them to take action, I think discipline will be what will be history and we will no longer be talking about indiscipline here, but we will be talking about appreciating people for going in for screening in order to end the epidemic within our communities. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Eric Tandy, public health expert, for always answering our call. Gladys Tata, that's the situation out there at the Public Health Emergency Operations Center. Over to you, studio. Thank you very much, uh, Gilbert Ongene, and to our public health expert for those explanations as usual. Today marked the start of the common entrance and entry and CCM examinations. Pupils nationwide in the English and French education subsystems headed to the different examination centers this Tuesday morning for this official evaluation, while school authorities remained keen on barrier measures. In the following report, Joyce Tata comes back to the atmosphere in the nation's capital on this first day of exams. They make their way to their examination centers, whether it pours or not. At the government English primary school at Tokobe Center, the authorities made sure the candidates properly wash their hands before entering the classrooms. We have uh, a total number of uh, 631 candidates that are writing here. And uh, since we have only 13 classrooms, so we have a sub-center at uh, PNEU. So here, we have 341 candidates. At 8.45 a.m., the first completed subject was sent to the secretariat, where the officials perused through making copy was left out. The wearing of face masks by every candidate is an obligation, which hierarchy made it 12 classrooms to give a face mask to pupils who may have forgotten theirs. The GBHS Etukebe Center welcomed the young ones sitting for the concours d'entrée en sixième, recording no absences. This morning we have uh, students uh, in this francophone subsystem. 
who, the primary school students who are to enter their first year in secondary school. We have about 453 students. We have 24 people per class. A hitch free unfolding of the 2020 session of the common entrance and concours d'entrée on sixième examinations in Yaoundé while parents patiently waited for their kids to ferry them home. Over 77,514 pupils have sat for the first year technical examination, while 185,000 pupils have taken the concours d'entrée en sixième across the national territory. Visiting some examination centers this Tuesday, secondary education boss Professor Nalo Valionga expressed satisfaction on the conduct of the, of the examination with respect to the COVID-19 barrier measures. Gerard Nanji Eyambe trailed the minister and has the details. It was a visibly calm atmosphere that welcomed the secondary education bus Tuesday at the Technical High School, just like the government Balingua High School all in Bancomo, the gateway to the nation's capital city from Douala End. The pupils were seriously reproducing what they must have acquired in the past months. After Mbankumo, the minister's convoy made similar stops at GBHS Mbankong, GHS BMRC, and finally at government Balingua High School Koletong. This is just one day's exam, and the, the results are good. All of them, I'm sure they're going to do well. Our problem will really be the space, because I think they're all quite ready to go to college. Let them continue to stay well. I really congratulate the parents so keeping our pupils very fit to take the exam. Even though the examinations were written in strict compliance with the COVID-19 barrier measures, there is need for more vigilance. The masks are not to be worn only in school. They are to be worn in school, outside of school, in the markets, wherever they are. They shouldn't just come because those things, the virus can come from outside with them. In the central region, 38,000 pupils wrote the concours d'entrée en sixième, the equivalent of the common entrance examination, while close to 17,000 took the first year technical examinations. Over in the Northwest region, officials confirmed that more than 5,000 people sat for the June 2020 common entrance and concours d'entrée en sixième examinations. The confirmation was made by the de regional delegate for secondary education, Ronan Guang, who added that the first day of exams went on hitch free. Julius Neba was at some examination centers in Bamenda and filed in this report. Be it here at GS Bamenda Up Station, Ecole de Champion, GS Downtown, and CBC Quen that harbored the different common entrance examination centers in Mezam and GBHS Bamenda Nkwe and four others that welcomed pupils sitting the Concours d'entrée and CZM, the learners could be seen heads down, seriously putting ink on their test sheets. The different chiefs of centers highlighted that, except for two or three absences here and there, all was well and everything had been put in place to ensure smooth operation of the exams, as was confirmed by the regional delegate of secondary education, who was on the field to take stock of the exercise. Feedback from the other centers outside Bamenda, the exercise has taken off very well. In fact, uh, only two students uh, absent. In an effort to keep the children from contracting the coronavirus during the exams, the necessary measures had been put in place by officials. Everything is in order. Even uh, for COVID-19, we have buckets, we have water, we have sanitizers and everything. Everything is moving on well. Mindful of the unstable sociopolitical atmosphere in the region, parents could be seen patiently waiting for the about six hours that the exams lasted to take their children home. For the pupils of class six and their peers of Kumayendu in the southwest region, today's exams went on without any hassles with school authorities, ensuring that the examinations process proceeded in the strict respect of preventive measures against COVID-19. Details with Chandong Levis Agbo of CRTV Southwest in Boya. Over 11,000 pupils sat the common entrance examination and concluded entry and CZM across the region. They started with the first paper of the day, which is Mathematics Paper 1. In the various centers in the regional capital, Buya, all barrier measures prescribed by government, such as social distancing, the wearing of face masks, and others were respected. When you enter all the classes, all the children are with their masks. They are with their masks on, and actually we have uh, buckets outside. There are buckets outside, wash hand, wash hand points, 
we have soap, we have sanitizers, everything is there, put in place. And the, inside the class, you see, we have put the 25 children per class, so that because of uh, social distancing. I came here with my two candidates. We did uh, dictation, and now we are on mathematics. The questions are average to the children. The exams unfolded in a calm and serene atmosphere. Nonetheless, there were some few absences and the challenge of pupils trying to locate their centers. But invigilators present ensured the pupils wrote under a typical examination condition. In the same building, Moliko today were writing Concord and Transisium. We are expecting 29 candidates with 28 of them showed up. The atmosphere has been serene and the exam has been going on smoothly. The pupils now look forward to the first school leaving certificate with all determination. Some civil servants are using the prevailing COVID-19 pandemic as pretext to desert their workplace in violation of the text of the Labour Code, an attitude which officials of the ministry charged with the management of careers of state personnel say sanctions will be meted on such workers. In the report that follows, Beatrice Ngom explains the two texts that regulate the career and status of state personnel and what sanctions are with them. The 1994 and 1978 text on the management of state personnel clearly spells out the obligations of the civil servant. Officially, work in Cameroon starts at 7.30 a.m. and wraps up at 3.30 p.m. But nowadays, late coming, absenteeism or a general atmosphere of inertia is characteristic of the public sector with untold adverse effects on the state business. Delay in the treatment of files is common practice among other forms of laxity at work. The first consequence is the lack of performance into the administration. When users come, there is no staff to receive them to solve their problem. Work begins at 7.30 and ends at 3.30. The Ministry of Public Service and Administrative Reform is working on a plan to crack down on perpetrators of inertia at the workplace, including those who are hiding behind a health crisis to stay away from work. Heavy sanctions await them. You can be admonished. You can be fined to the disciplinary council. Query letter to give explanation on their absence. And at last, you can be sacked from the public service. Besides warnings and salary suspensions, some workers risk worst punishment. After 30 days of absence, you can be directly sacked without passing through the disciplinary council. In spite of the different mechanisms to control effective presence at work, such as the biometric system and assiduity control sheets used in some ministries, inspection teams will reinforce these measures. There is a special department in the Ministry of the Public Service, the Department of Discipline and Education, and the Department of Forecasting Presence. So they used to make some visits to be sure that public agents are present at their posts. According to the Cameroon Labor Code, workers are entitled to five days of work a week and are not allowed to work beyond eight hours a day, making it a total of 40 hours a week. Beware on uh, ghost workers. Members of dialogue consultation and follow-up committee met in Yaoundé today for their 24th and 25th ordinary session. It is the first time since the beginning of the year that they are meeting due to the coronavirus pandemic, a rather challenging context for employers and workers given the status quo. The Ministry of Labor and Social Security, Gregor Wona, presided over the meeting. As you tell us, Yuti Kaleli Songe. With the calendar of activities modified by COVID-19, the Social Dialogue Consultation and Follow-up Committee can only meet now, since the beginning of the year, for their 24th and 25th ordinary sessions. Talking points centered on how to legally organize public manifestations, the impact of social dialogue on local development, and the respect of gender equality. It was important for us to meet today to talk while waiting on the ongoing amelioration of the sanitary situation, given that social dialogue undoubtedly plays a capital role in periods of normalcy and crisis. 
Trade unionists may be a little disgruntled considering the number of problems solved so far, but they've resolved to remain reasonable. We keep telling the government that we are ready to collaborate for there to be development in this country through social dialogue. Meanwhile, the Registry of Trade Unions and Employers Associations downtown Yaoundé has been inaugurated by the Minister of Labor and Social Security, Gregoire Wona. I'm a very happy trade unionist. We henceforth have a befitting workspace. The building is beautiful. Here we can easily meet and discuss work-related issues. A move taken to ensure a better organization of trade unions and employers' associations as they go about their affairs. As we told you earlier on, Cameroon's new ambassador to France has been appointed by President Paul Bia. André Manus Ekomo was appointed by presidential decree today. Charles Ebune has more. Always beside President Paul Bia during audiences at the Unity Palace, this is André Magnus Ekomo. The roughly 63-year-old Cameroonian, today appointed by President Paul Bia as Cameroon's ambassador extraordinary and plenipotentiary to the French Republic, the country with one of the largest Cameroonian diaspora communities in Europe of roughly 30,000 individuals. I want to thank the President of the Republic for this appointment because uh, I think uh, he, relies, he relies on me is why he accept to send me uh, to Paris to represent the Cameroon and himself. André Magnus Ekumu is a product of Cameroonian and French schools and had worked in the Ministry of External Relations before moving to the Presidency of the Republic roughly 25 years ago as one of the closest collaborators of the President of the Republic. When you work with, uh, with the President, you have to be patient. I think after 25 years, is uh, I think I am all, one of the uh, oldest civil servant of the presidency. When you even when you are beside the president, you have to be patient. One of the best known characters of Andre Magnus Ekumu is his discreet character. Speaks very rarely, and it is one of the qualities required by any diplomat. Newly appointed staff of the Cameroon Radio and Television CRTV have taken duty at the central and decentralized services of the corporation. While officially commissioning them through a video conference, the Director General, Sean Dongo, enjoined them to work towards maintaining CRTV's leading position in the audiovisual landscape. Iwana Epole covered the installation ceremony this Friday at the TV Center in Bala 2 and now reports. The newly installed are directors, editorialists, deputy directors and heads of services of the central and decentralized department of the Cameroon Radio Television, CRTV. The installation ritual was done through a video conference presided by the director general. I urge you now, more than ever, to be in tune with our audiences, attentive to the development of in our cooperation and our changing environment, your management should be based on a continuous assessment of your activities and performance. Appointees have expressed gratitude to top management. I wish to use this forum to say uh, thank you to the Board of Administrators and to the Director General of CRTV, uh, the radio, having been a television person all these years, but I think that is an advantage for me. Thanking uh, top management for this uh, mark of confidence shown uh, me. Russians, as you know, is a very important component in every uh, media organization. And I'm glad that at the head of it is uh, somebody who is tipped in production management. Just start by expressing my gratitude to my hierarchy, having doubly recognized me, first by elevating me to the rank of an editorialist, and then secondly appointing me a deputy director of the television news department in charge of magazines. On the occasion, the Director General, Shaul Ndongo, and his deputy, Emmanuel Wongibe, celebrated their fourth anniversary as managers at the helm of CRTV. 
Congratulations to all those newly appointed. And to that is where we draw the curtains on this edition of the 7.30 News. Join Adel Mbala at 8.30 for the News in French. I'll be back tomorrow, same time. Until then, keep the faith. Good night. In this connection, we should avoid stigmatizing 